And, um, and we'll be done in about another three years. Um, but we're going to be picking it up in verse 8. Verse 8. Um, with stops all over the place. Um, so let's pray and ask God to bless our Bible study. Father, we thank you so much for being here waiting for us, ready and so wanting to do a work in your church. Not just a work in your church, but that it would be a work through your church. That by the empowering and the equipping of your word, you would send us out of this place prepared. Prepared to present the glorious gospel of Jesus Christ. Father, we ask that you would this day prepare us. Make us a sanctuary that you would fill us overflowing with love, and that, Lord, you would speak to our hearts. We ask that you would truly transform us, that you would change us. Quicken us, Lord. Bless us, that we might be a blessing to you. Pour out your Spirit mightily among us, we ask now in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. There is a date, and if you wait... Well, it'll be too late. And everyone has a date. And if you wait, it'll be too late. You see it all around us. It's called the expiration date. Whether it's on milk or medicine, whether it's on meat or vegetables, they all have a best used by an expiration date. And you have one too. Most of them are located on the bottom of the bottles and well, maybe yours is located on your bottom too. I don't know, but you have one. You have one. We saw it this morning as Pastor Jim read Psalm 90 in verse 10. We read, the days of our lives are 70 years and if by reason of strength, they're 80 years, 80 years. And because we all have an expiration date, Moses said in verse, verse 12, So teach me to number my days that we may gain a heart of wisdom. A heart of wisdom. Your days are numbered. God's got your number. In more ways than one, He's got your number. Oh, yeah. And He knows the number of your days. The earth has an expiration date. Jesus said in Matthew 24, verse 35, The heaven and the earth will pass away, but my words by no means will pass away. And in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 10, Peter says this, he says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief as a night, in which the heavens will pass away with a great noise, and the elements will melt with a fervent heat. Both the earth and the works that are in it will be burned up. The, the, the works in it? Yeah, the things you do will all be burned up. And he goes on to say in verse 11, Therefore, since all these things will be dissolved, what manner of person ought you to be in holy conduct and godliness, looking for, a hastening, the coming, looking for and hastening the coming of the day of God, because of which the heavens will be dissolved, being on fire, and the elements will melt with fervent heat? So everything has a best used by or an expiration date. And every one of us, though we have one too, we all think, I got time. We got time. But sadly, just as sand slips through your fingers or water as you try and cup it, it just falls right through your hands, so too do the days of your life. They just sadly slip away. And by the time we realize it, sometimes, it's just too late. Time's up. It's passed you by. And since it's true, and we can recognize it is true that we all have a limited amount of time, wouldn't it be wise to maximize what we have, what we've been given? To maximize it for eternal effectiveness, to maximize it for supreme value, to get the most out of life, 
for the next life? I knew a pastor years ago, and he was diagnosed with macular degeneration. Maca, who, what, what? Macular degeneration. He was losing his eyesight. And a group of pastors surrounded him and laid hands on him. And he came forward trusting God for, for healing, trusting for miracles. And the pastors, we all trusted God to work. And hands were laid on him, believing God would do a mighty work. But in talking to him, what, what I found so interesting was this faithful servant of God, faithful man of God, in and out, of, you know, just day in and day out, in the pulpit, blessing people, teaching. This is what he said. He said, though I might be completely blind within the next two years, I have made it a point to see as much of life, to do as much life and serve the Lord as much as possible, not knowing how long I have. I don't know how long I'll see. But with what I do have, I'm going to get the most out of it for the next life. And if you here have legs that can walk, arms that can embrace, eyes that can see, ears that can hear, a mouth that can speak, you can proclaim the love of Jesus Christ. Amen. And before any one of those things begin to fade from you, don't you want to make the most of it? Don't you want to get the most out of it? Don't you want to leave? There's nothing worse than leaving something on the table. Something, I mean, it's like, I, I could have, I should have, but I didn't. Don't you want to make the most out of what the Lord has given to you? Or do you think that there's plenty of time? And that's the point. That's the point of what the Holy Spirit is making right here in Romans chapter 13. We pick it up in verse 8 where we read, Owe no one anything except to love one another, for he who loves another has fulfilled the law. For the commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, all are summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor, therefore love is the fulfillment of the law. And do this knowing the time, that now it is high time to wake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than when we first believed. The night is far spent. The day is at hand. Therefore, let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Let us walk properly as in the day, not in revelry and drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife and envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Now remember, church, Beginning in chapter 12, it's a whole new section of the book of Romans. And God is telling his children, hey, children, this is how you should live. God is giving us a description of who a Christian is, what a Christian looks like. Why? Well, he says in chapter 12, so that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. And Paul has been describing in a very practical way how we should live. You know, it, it's one thing to go around telling people, hey, do this and do that. And you go, well, how? How do I do it? You know, it's, it's like, hey, go build this. Well, you gave me no directions. How am I supposed to do it? Go do this on the computer. Hey, I've never had a class. How do I do it? But here, God is saying, this is how you live. And Paul is saying, and this is how you do it. I love that. God is telling me exactly what I should do and how I should do it. And it's very practical. And he says, hey, with the gifts of the Holy Spirit, you are to serve one another in the church. Serve one another. Serve each other. And after you've learned to serve one another, you're to serve and love each other outside of the church. So it's just not like a social club. We love each other, and then we take that same love, and we give it to the world. We give it to the world. We tell people about love, the love of God, the love of Jesus Christ. First, to the family of God. Secondly, to the unbelieving world. 
to our enemies. Our enemies? I don't want to love my enemy. I want to hate my enemy. Well, you have to love your enemy. And that's why you need the gifts of the Holy Spirit. That's why you need God working in your life. And last week we learned as Paul told us how the Christian relates to government and how we submit to the governing authorities. But here this morning, beginning in verse 8, look at verse 8 with me. Oh, no one anything except to love one another. For he who loves has fulfilled the law. This is not only great advice, it's godly wisdom. It's godly wisdom for the ages, not just for today, but for tomorrow. And it's a wonderful point that the Holy Spirit is making. And if you're a note taker, you have pen in hand, write it like this. Be careful what you spend. Be careful what you spend. Well, what do you mean? Be careful what you spend. Listen, listen. Immediately when you think about spending, you think money. But you spend time. You spend time. Be careful where you spend your time. Uh, words. You spend words. Sisters, you spend more words than us guys. Amen. Guys, we get in more trouble with what we spend. Amen. Be careful what you spend. I I'm sure you've said things that you're like, it's coming out of your mouth, you're going, oh, can I put it back? Be careful how you spend your words. Be careful how you spend your time. Be careful how you spend your money. How you spend your money. The Lord tells us to be careful. Why? Because you only get so much. You only get so much. You only have so much time. You only have so much. And it doesn't matter what it is. You're only given so much. So you need to be careful. Paul says, oh, no one anything. Well, wait a minute, pastor. That sounds, that's like a prohibition. That means I'm never supposed to spend a dime. No, that's not what that's saying. A newer translation sheds a little bit of light on it, and, and it says this. The Living Bible translates it like this. Pay all your debts except the debt of love. For others never finish paying that. For if you love them, you will be obeying all of God's laws, fulfilling all of his requirements. The implication is there will be reasonable debt in a person's life. Reasonable debt. Debts that you can pay, but there is one debt that you will never be able to pay, and that's the debt of love. You can never pay it. It, 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 it. It'll never go away. You have to love. Love. You can never pay that debt. Why can't I pay that debt? Because Jesus paid that debt. See, there are debts that the Bible tells us you should incur. And these are spiritual debts. Romans chapter 1, verse 14, the Apostle Paul says this, I am a debtor both to the Greeks and to the barbarians, both to wise and unwise. So as much as is in me, I am ready to preach the gospel to you who are in Rome also. What's that? Listen, Paul felt because of everything that Jesus Christ had done for him, he owed the world to preach the gospel. And that's our debt, too. Because of everything that Jesus has done, we owe the world to tell people about Jesus Christ. And we can never satisfy that debt. It's a spiritual debt. In Romans chapter 8, verse 12, Paul says this, Therefore, brethren, we are debtors, not to the flesh, to live according to the flesh. What Paul is saying here is, listen, listen, listen. He acknowledges. He is acknowledging that we are all in debt to the Holy Spirit. Because Jesus Christ died for our sins, we are now indebted to the Holy Spirit to live a holy and sanctified life. Why? Because we've been bought with a price, the precious blood of Jesus Christ. He shed that blood, and because of that, we owe this spiritual debt to the Holy Spirit to live a holy life. And here, in Romans chapter 13, verse 8, look at it. Oh, no one anything except to love one another. Here Paul is saying, listen, pay your personal debts. And sure, you know, it's best that in everything you do in life you pay cash. But the Bible is very specific. That's not always reasonable. It's not reasonable. But what he's saying, and in the original Greek, this is how it would be presented because it's in the present tense. It says, do not keep owing anyone anything. 
Don't keep owing. Don't keep owing. See, in other words, don't have this recyclable, recurring debt. Don't keep owing. Don't keep owing anyone anything except to love them. And you can never satisfy that love. You can't. And if you incur debt, knowing, knowing you can't or won't pay it, you're in sin. You're in sin. If you go into debt saying, eh, I'm going to go bankrupt anyway, so let's just charge up this car. Let's go do this. Let's go do that. I'm not going to pay it anyways. You're in sin. See, the system of borrowing and lending is implied and presupposed throughout the Scriptures, beginning in Exodus all throughout. Even Jesus in Matthew chapter 25, verse 15, write it down and read it at your homework. Jesus tells us a story about five guys that go to the master and borrow money. Some five, four, three, one talents. They borrow money to invest into the kingdom of God. And then after they've invested, after a period of time, the scripture says that they go back to settle accounts to pay back what they had borrowed. And the first one comes back with 10. And hey, well done, good and faithful servant. <laughs> you did good. You borrowed five and you came back with 10. You doubled your money. But one, he says, depart from me, you worker of iniquity. Why? Because he buried it in the ground. He buried it in the ground. The best way to biblically look at this, since lending is presupposed in God's word, but it must be done biblically. We have to look at it biblically. And the practice, though it's not condemned, the practice is not condemned, the position must be considered. The position of being in debt must be considered. And we can illustrate this in Proverbs 22, verse 7 on the board, where we read, The rich rule over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. Did you catch that? The rich rule over the poor, and the borrower is servant to the lender. Here we see that the practice of lending, borrowing, it's not condemned, but the position. That's what we need to consider. The position of the servant to the lender. See that word servant? It's also translated, if you have pencil in hand, write this down as labor or bondage. It's the same word, labor or bondage. The more in debt you are, the greater or heavy the bondage you carry. But not all debt is bad. Not all debt is bad. You know, well, we need to work, right? You need to work. And so you want to make sure you have a car that gets to work. You know, if you go out and, you know, buy $200 for a clunker because you could pay cash for that, and, you know, it's breaking down all the time, you're always late, you get written up at work, hey, you got fired because your vehicle didn't get you there, that doesn't make any sense. So now you're going to go and you need a vehicle because you need to provide for your family. So now you have choices to make. And this is what the Bible is always talking about, choices. So you can choose. You can get a nice cute little red Toyota that, you know, if you're lucky and somebody's pushing from behind, you can go 70 miles an hour, but you get great gas mileage, good, steady transportation. That's debt. That's debt. That's a form of bondage, but it's light. It's light bondage. It's light bondage. It's not heavy, heavy bondage. It's light bondage. Or you go by the Chevy place and you see that Corvette. Oh, yeah. Black, slick wheels. Oh, that's more bondage. Heavier bondage. Wait, wait. but you know, you're, you're into luxury. So there's the Mercedes Benz. Oh. You have choices. You have choices as far as your debt, your, your bondage. Now, the thing about it is the more bondage, the heavier the bondage, the less you are able to do things. So a brother comes to you and, you know, and you got that Corvette you with that insurance and that gas and everything else. And, and he says, hey, man, you know, I'm really short right now. Can you loan me $20 so I can get gas to get me to and work? And hey, brother, I'd love to give you $20. But I can't seem to 
reach my pocket because my insurance just went up and I got bondage. I got a heavy car payment. Uh, I'd love to help. I Man. I'm tied. I'm tied up. What can I do? I'm in bondage. God wants to provide a home for you, right? He doesn't want you living on the street. You're, you're, you're working. You, you got a good job. You're saving. And, and it's like family's growing. And that little apartment just doesn't work. So what do you do? Do you rent or do you buy? Well, those of you that know me know that I work in the mortgage industry. I'm a government underwriter. And so I write VA loans all day long. And I see these guys come in, and they, they, the vets, and they're paying $1,200 for rent. And they're going to buy a house, and their payment's going to be $800. What would you, what's the smart thing to do? Of course you buy. You're lowering your housing expense. So you have a choice. You have a choice. There's that nice, quaint little three-bedroom, two-bath place. No pool, not much of a landscape, but it meets all the needs of your household. You know, all your family, storage, everything else. You know, 1,500 square feet, perfect for your house. $800. Well, that, again, it's bondage. It's bondage, right? It's bondage. But your realtor takes you up the road and into a gated community on the golf course. Near the lake, it's not on the lake, four bedrooms, three bathrooms, gated community, 3,000 square feet, golf course, gated community, lake is nearby. We can qualify you, no problem. We can get you in that house in 30 days. Well, the payment, $2,400. But don't you deserve it? You work hard for your money. We can get you an upgrade jacuzzi, too. You have choices. And you see, the more debt, the more weight. And the more limited you are to serve God, the more limited you are to do other things, and did you know borrowing money, well, you're actually buying money at a higher price, more than it's worth. Did you know that? Did you know that when you go to borrow money, you're paying more than it's worth? So you go to the store and you have a hankering for a Hershey's chocolate bar. Milk, chocolate, silky smooth. You can pay cash one dollar, but if you put it on a credit card, do you know you're saying, "I'll buy this one dollar credit, this one dollar calorie bar for a dollar twenty-five"? What? Yeah, you put it on a credit card, you're paying a dollar twenty-five for a one dollar candy bar. You understand? Banks are in the business of selling you money for more than it's worth. Did you know that banks are in the money to make money? Because see. The lender, they're the rich guy. The poor, that's you who's in debt. I'm in debt. I have a house payment. I have a car payment. I'm just like you, but we have choices. And, and the thing is, is banks never lose money. Well, what about TARP? Well, they made a lot of money off of you. I have a friend, a guy I went to high school with. So we're going way back. It's a Peabody way back machine. We graduated in 79 and he started college. He went a year and he had a $1,500 student loan. He dropped out of school, started doing all kinds of things, and basically blew off the loan. 30 years later, he came to know the Lord. And the Lord said, you got to pay your debt. He owes $10,128. $10,000. $128. Well, how can that be? It was $1,500. Interest compounded. He's going to be paying $79 for the rest of his life, and he'll never pay it off. He'll never pay it off. Do you know how much furniture that you could leave here today? You can leave here today, and you know how much furniture you can buy and not pay until 2015? And no sales tax. What? 
I can go get a new mattress today, sleep in it for four years, and it's worn out, and then start paying for it? Let's go. How can businesses be so generous to just give their stuff away? They're not. That $300 mattress, four years from now, your payment, you're paying $2,500 for it. We're giving it away. And there's a sucker born every day. Now, there are circumstances, and I, I, we're making light of a serious thing, but there are circumstances in life that are outside your control that make it impossible for you to make that house payment that make it impossible to make that car payment. There are circumstances that might lead you to a bankruptcy or a foreclosure or a short sale. And these are very real and they're outside of your control. But what Paul is saying here is, listen, if you go into debt knowing full, where, full well you're never intending to pay it back, don't do that. Don't do that. Don't do that. If you know you're not going to make the payment, you shouldn't have the the product. See, debt isn't bad. It's not evil. It's like people saying, well, money's evil. No, it's not. It's the love of money that's evil. Amen. Money is a tool. Debt is a tool. The, the farmer goes in debt to get his seed to plant, knowing that there'll be a harvest that'll come. The manufacturer goes and gets in debt to buy new machinery, knowing that he has a product to put out. Debt isn't bad. Debt is a tool if it's used correctly. And what Paul is saying here is that don't get in debt with the idea or purpose of not paying it back. And secondly, don't overextend yourself. Prepare for the unforeseeable. See, remember, you know, godly wisdom? Remember that? Do you want godly wisdom? Godly wisdom says, be prepared for what might happen. If you spend every cent you got then when crunch time happens, where are you at? You need to prepare. Now, the first indication of a person's spiritual maturity or a person's spiritual commitment, and I'm going to be an equally opportunity offender right now, so everybody can be offended and send me emails, that's fine. The first, the first thing that you can see if somebody's spiritual maturity or their commitment to the Lord, look in their checkbook. Look in their checkbook. If you want to know where somebody is in their walk with the Lord, look in their checkbook. I had a pastor friend of mine. He's pastoring a church up north. Um, I was in the, already in the ministry, and, and he felt called in the ministry. And he worked in the motion picture industry, TVs. And he was a key grip. And some of you people are going, what's a key grip? Because they have a lot of keys. And No, what they do is they do lighting and stuff for shows. That's what they do. And it's a union. And um, basically, as a key grip, you, you basically make about $45, $50 an hour. And he would work, and then all of a sudden he would get laid off, and he'd be laid off for years on end, and they would get unemployment and special benefits from, the, um, from their union that would keep him afloat. But he would sit there and say, I don't understand why God isn't blessing me. Why are all my friends, why are all these other people getting jobs, but I, I'm not even getting a call? And I said, I'm not going to say his name. I'll call him Bert. No one here named Bert, I hope. Okay, good. Bert or Ernie. Bert and Ernie. Okay, <laughs> Bert, let me see your checkbook. He goes, what? Let me see your checkbook. I opened up his checkbook, and I started going down his register, and it said, it said bowling alley, bowling alley, bowling alley, bowling alley, Applebee's. Bowling alley, bowling alley, bowling alley, bowling alley. I said, where's your walk? Where's your walk? He goes, what do you mean? I said, you're, every cent you get, you're spending on your flesh. He goes, what do you mean? I said, I went to the bowling alley with you once. He goes, yeah, how come you never came again? I said, because you, he, a great bowler. He has 10, 300 rings. He has a watch. All, I mean, literally, he could have been professional. Problem was, he allowed drugs and alcohol to get in the way of a talent. And I said, I went to the bowling alley with you once. And I watched you bowl and drink yourself drunk. I'm not about that, man. I'm not going to go again. If you want to do that, you, you're on your own. And he said, man, that's wrong. I thought you cared. I said, I do care. And I'm not going to watch you do that because I care. 
He said he went home and he prayed and God said, do you want your reward now or do you want it later? He said, I want it later. And he came to me and he said, you know what? I repent. You're right. I, I'm giving up bowling. I'm going to serve the Lord with all of my heart. And he got a job two days later. And he's been working pretty steady ever since for Disney, doing a lot of these shows and whatnot. And he's pastoring, so he spends the week there, drives back, you know, 600 miles to pastor, and then after Sunday, drives back to work so he can support his family. See, it's not that debt is bad. The choice is what comes first in your life? What comes first in your life? See, the Living Bible translates... Actually, I already did that, didn't I? The choice is what do we do with our lives and what God gives us? Jesus said in Luke chapter 16, verse 10, He was faithful in what is least is faithful also in what is much. He is faithful in what is least is also faithful in what is much. And he who is unjust, unjust in what is least is unjust in what is also much. Therefore, if you, do not, if you have not been faithful in what is unrighteous mammon, if you have not been faithful in unrighteous money, money which is least, who will commit to you or entrust to you the true riches, spiritual riches? So the Bible tells us that if we put Jesus first in our life, then Jesus promises that he'll take care of all of our needs. Amen. Not your wants, but your needs. Amen. Secondly, the second reason you need to watch out is bondage. If you want to be in bondage, let that bondage be what Paul is talking about here, loving others. And not just loving others. Oh, I love you, brother. This, he's talking about a radical, reckless love. A radical, reckless love. And, and this kind of love, it doesn't rip people off. Look at this. He says, he who loves another has fulfilled the law. The NIV puts verse 8 this way. Let no debt remain outstanding except the continual debt to love one another. For he who loves his fellow man has fulfilled the law. We're to love with a reckless, radical love. Jesus put it this way in John 13, 35. By this all will know that you're my disciples if you have love for one another. Jesus said in John 15, 12, This is my commandment, that you love one another as I have loved you. And this is how radical he's talking about it. Look at this. Greater love has no one than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. Now, this is always easy if you love those people, huh? Well, I like them, so I'll love them radically. I like you. I'll, I'm just going to lavish you with love. But if you don't like that person, it ain't so easy. You're supposed to love your enemy. Well, I don't want to. I want to kill them. They're my enemy. Love them. Love them radically. Jesus says this in uh, Luke chapter 4, verse 18. The Spirit of the Lord is upon me because He has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to heal the brokenhearted, to proclaim liberty to the captives and recover the sight of the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed. Do you know who Jesus is talking about here? You! He's describing you! Look, look, at, look how Jesus is describing you. Poor, brokenhearted, captive that's blind and oppressed. You get a bunch of those together, you got a mess. It's a real mess. But that's us. And we're to love one another. Another. That word another in verse 8, it's elios in the Greek, and it means members of one another. You're to love the members of the church body first. But then... Then he goes on to say, he who loves another has fulfilled the law. That other, another, that word, that second word is heteros. And it means others. Love others outside of the church. Sometimes loving someone is saying no. Sometimes loving someone is spanking your children. See, love manifests itself in a lot of different ways. The Bible says if you see a brother or sister in a fault, you're to go to them. So that means love means if you see a brother or sister in sin, you lovingly go to them to restore them. 
You don't go to them, oh, you stinking sinner. Ha! Repent or burn. No. You lovingly go to them and you say, man, this is just not good for your life. This could destroy your family. Turn. Turn. Turn to the Lord. You lovingly come to them. But love isn't always saying yes. Sometimes saying yes can do more harm than good. Sin must be confronted, and a person who loves you will confront you with that. And that person who does that fulfills the law of Moses. And what is the law of Moses? Look at verse 9. And this is talking about the second tablet of the law of Moses. For the commandments... Oh, and just so you know, the commandments, it means the commandments. It doesn't mean the suggestions. You know, we suggest that you do this. No, it's the commandments. The commandments, you shall not commit adultery, you shall not murder, you shall not steal, you shall not bear false witness, you shall not covet. And if there is any other commandment, are all summed up in this saying, namely, you shall love your neighbor as yourself. Love does no harm to a neighbor. Therefore, love is the fulfillment of the law. If our first point this morning was be careful what you spend, our second point has to be you love recklessly and radically. Well, Pastor, I can't write that down. That got me in trouble loving recklessly. I got in a lot of trouble doing that. Wrong kind of love. See, remember we just read, love does no harm. This is agape love. See, that love that got you in trouble, that's worldly love. Agape love is other-centered. It's the wrong love that you're talking about. Agape love is righteous love. It's God's love. It's not in moral, the not in moral love of the world. It's God love is righteous, and we unfortunately, as God has generously poured out that love to us, we dole it out a little here, a little there. Oh, I'll give you some of God's love. Here's a little bit of love. This a little bit here, a little bit here. But that's not what he's saying here. See, we give it to a very select group of people, but God, who gave us all his love on the cross, and has given us an endless resource of love through the Holy Spirit, here in verse 9, he commands his kids, okay, you don't do this, but what you do do. And that is where the emphasis should be. Not on what you shouldn't do, but what you should do. Because if you're doing what you should do, you don't have to worry about what you shouldn't do, right? Right? If you're doing what you should do, you don't worry about what you shouldn't do. And he says, love, love. With a radical, a radical, radical, reckless love. Reckless. You'll give it to anybody. I got the love of Jesus and I'm giving it to anybody. Who wants them? If you don't want it, you're getting it anyways. Ah! You're going to get it. But let me ask you a question. Have you, have I what? I'm scared now. Have you ever wanted to, what? <laughs> commit adultery. Have you ever wanted to commit adultery? Or have you ever wanted to murder someone? Wives, stop looking at your husbands. <laughs> husbands, I know you're thinking of that person you want to kill right now. Have you ever wanted to steal something? Have you ever wanted to lie for someone? Have you ever lied for someone? Have you ever wanted to lie about someone? Have you ever wanted what your neighbor had? Oh, I like their car. I like their lawnmower. Oh, he's got a really cool drill. I want that drill. Well, stop that. See, God tells you not even to think like that. You shouldn't even think like that. Like what? Exactly. Exactly. Instead of focusing on what I'm not supposed to do, we need to focus on what God is commanding us to do, which is to love recklessly, with radical love. Spending our love recklessly, loving one another both in the family of God and outside the family of God. Reckless, radical love is the same love that Jesus Christ gave. Remember? No greater love has anyone than this, than to lay down one's life for his friends. And look what Paul says in verse 11 of Romans 13. And do this. Do what? That. Love recklessly. Do that. 
knowing that the time that it is now high time to awake out of sleep. For now our salvation is nearer than it was when we first believed. The night is far spent, the day is at hand. Therefore let us cast off the works of darkness and let us put on the armor of light. Our third point this morning, wake up! Wake up and put off foolish, fleshly foolishness. Put off fleshly foolishness. Well, I don't understand. Listen, what Paul is giving you here is it's a word picture. Remember, Paul is in jail. On one hand, he has chains that connect him to a Roman soldier. On the other hand, he has another Roman soldier. Bondage. Chained to two guys that are with him all the time. So he has this word picture that he sees every day where these Roman soldiers, what they would do is at the first crack of daylight, you know, when it first comes up, they would immediately cast off their coverings and take off their night clothes and put on their armor. Grab the helmet, grab the shield, grab the sword, ready for battle. Every day, boom, I'm ready for whatever the day has. And so what he has is this word picture, and it's a word picture saying, wake up, be ready. Wake up, be ready. See that word night in verse 10, or excuse me, 12? Circle it and write this world. The night is far spent. What he's really saying here is, is, listen, the world is far spent and the kingdom of our Lord is at hand. The night is far spent. You think you have time, you don't have any time because the world is far spent. And so... Because of that, we're to take off the old man, the old habits. Do you know you guys, we all have habits that we don't even realize we have? Our spouses do. Oh, we know, they know our habits. They see it, and they are like, they hate it. My girls, Kalia was in the first service. She has a habit, she doesn't even know that she, she bites her nails. I mean, it's like you'll sit there and say, her fingers are in her mouth, literally. Take your fingers out of your mouth. They're not. <laughs> Our middle one, she has a bad habit. She likes to pick her nose. Ariana, take your finger out of your nose. It's not. <laughs> She's five. You give her a break. <laughs> but we all have old habits that we don't even notice, like dirty underwear. You don't even notice it's dirty until you take it off. You go, oh, really? Ooh. And so what he's saying here is you cast, it's really what he's saying, you cast off your old dirty garments, cast them away. You cast them off. See that word darkness, circle it and write next to it sin or wickedness. See we're to cast off sin and we're to put on, we're to clothe ourselves with the armor of God. Ephesians chapter 6, the armor of God, clothed fully in the armor of God, literally the armor of truth or the armor of life here. We're to wake up. Wake up out of fleshly foolishness, putting childish things away. Let me illustrate it like this. Now that I'm turning the corner and I'm almost 50 years old, when I was a kid, it's a long time ago, my brother, he's 11 months older than me, so for one month a year we're the same age. And my sister is three years older than us. So we had G.I. Joes, and when I was a kid, G.I. Joes were really cool. They weren't these little, I mean, they were cool. Full on Jeep, made out of metal. I mean, they were cool. I had G.I. Joe's. I mean, hey, I'm G.I. Joe. Nice to meet you. I'm G.I. Joe too. Hey, Joe, nice to meet you, Joe. My sister had Barbies. Barbies were cool then too. And so we go, hi, I'm Joe. Hi, Barbie. Want to go for a run my Jeep? Okay, let's go. (laughs) And away we go. My mom never had to come to me and say, David, put the Joe's away. I got older. I got older, and as I got older, I discovered things like firecrackers and gunpowder, and, well, G.I. Joe got blown up. (laughs) It was a tragic accident. Car and everything. But nobody had to tell me, David, stop playing with kid toys. You're not going to find me over there with the little Mickey Mouse thing, go-ping, go-ping. You know what I mean? I mean, I, I... became a teenager. I graduated the sixth grade and got into junior high and, well, you know, I discovered that Barbie is for real. (laughs) 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 What I'm saying, (laughs) 
<laughs> there are things that are part of an immature heart. And as you grow up, you need to grow out of them. You need to grow out of them. And, and do, by knowing what time it is, by understanding what time it is, and that word time back in verse 11, circle it, the Greek word is, is carry on, but right next to it, write season. Right next to it, epics, events, ages. Knowing the season that we're in. Knowing the age that we're in. Understanding that, what he's saying is, hey, do you understand the age that you're in, that you're living in? And so because of that, you need to cast away these foolishness. Because you don't have that much more time. The Lord can come back at any time. He's not sending a notice to anyone saying, David, um, you have a week. And so he can come back at any time. So if he can come back at any time, you need to take off the dirty garments and you need to clothe yourself in the gloriousness of Jesus Christ. So he says in verse 13, Let us walk properly, as in the day, not in revelry or drunkenness, not in lewdness, not in lust, not in strife or envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. If you know the season, and, and I love the way the writer in Hebrews puts it. Hebrews chapter 12, verse 1, um, this is what the Holy Spirit says. He says, Therefore also, since we are surrounded by so great a cloud of witnesses, let us lay aside every weight and sin which so easily ensnares us, and let us run with an endurance the race that is set before us, looking unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith, who for the joy that was set before him endured the cross, despising the shame, and has sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. Well, you know, what, what ensnares you? What keeps you from running that race? Is, you know, what's, what's that weight? I made myself some Galilean shoes to illustrate this point. Some of you may or not be able to see it. But some of you are wearing weights. <sighs> Maybe it is debt. Maybe, I don't know. Maybe it's fame. Maybe it's fortune. Maybe it's some other fantasy that is a weight that's on your life. And Paul tells us, let us walk properly as in the day. Not in revelry or drunkenness, not in lewdness and lust, not in strife or envy, but put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lust. Listen, if darkness in the Bible speaks of sin and arrogance and apathy for the Christian, that night is over. Do you understand? If you're a born-again Christian, the night is over, that it's now daytime for you. You've been saved out of sin and death and darkness into His marvelous light. And so you're to put off those things and put on Jesus Christ. He says, put them off. Put off the deeds of the darkness, which is revelry, revelry. It's also translated as rioting. At one time, this word meant people that followed their hometown team and cheered them on. So like at the Olympics, they would follow an athlete. But at the time of Paul, the word actually changed. And here, what it is, is it's speaking of noisy troublemakers, hooligans, rowdy people who destroy public property for fun. You ever see on the news, like whenever there's these soccer matches all over the place, and these hooligans go from country to country cheering their team and destroying everything in their path? You ever see that? That's what he's talking about. He says drunkenness. Drunkenness. This is unrestrained binge drinking. Anyone in college here? You see it in colleges. You hear about kids binge drinking and, and dying from the poison. Lewdness, or literally sexual excess. It's licentiousness or sexual morality. And it's sexual morality as defined by the Bible, not the Internet. And then we have lust. And the idea here is an open display of immorality or profanity. 
and, and the idea is you don't care who sees it, who hears it. You don't care if there's a two-year-old or a 50-year-old. You're going to display your sexuality and your morality and your profanity. And this describes Hollywood to a T. They don't care what they put on TV. You know, back in my day, you know, if you're going to reminisce, you know, it's like back in 1985, you know, what were the top movies? Well, Back to the Future was one of the top movies. You guys remember that? You know, one of the top songs, The Power of Love. Oh, the power of love, honey. Mm -hmm. You know, Starship, We Built This City, was also voted one of the worst songs of all times. <laughs> but, you, but, you know, you reminisce about those things. And, and back then, there was a show called NYPD Blue. And this really short, kind of out of shape guy bared his buns on TV, and everyone went, oh. <gasps> And I'm thinking, dude, get somebody in shape. Come on. Yuck. <laughs> and now, it's all over the place. Five years from now, you're going to see, you're going to turn on channel 12, and you're going to see some girl running around topless. Because, see, they introduce it a little at a time. They anesthetize you. So it's like, oh, yeah, that's not a big deal. That word's not a big deal. That thought's not a big deal. Oh, there are a lot of men living together raising children. It's not a big deal. It's not a big deal. And you just get used to it. You get used, and you know, we don't want to raise our voice. We don't want to say anything. We don't want to offend anybody. Our fifth example is strife. Strife. This is the desire for prestige or a position. This is the kind of person that wants to be noticed. You know, it's like in a little over four years, there's been a few people that have come to me and said, hey, I want to be your assistant pastor. So, well, well, whatever, you know, do the work. We don't give titles. We serve the Lord. Oh, no, 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 I want to, I've, I've called, God's called me to do this. Well, do the work. Oh, no, 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 it's like, oh, I, I, need my, I need my picture on the, on the website. I, I need the name. I need the title. And, and, and I said, well, no, you know, just come and do the work. He goes, no, no, I'll fill in for you. You know, you need to take time off. I'll, I'll fill in. No. It's all about Jesus. It's not about David. It's not about anybody. It's about Jesus and Jesus crucified. Nobody, nobody should be looking for a position or to be noticed. And finally, we have this word envy. Envy. This is the intense negative feeling over another's achievement or success. Jealousy. You ever had that thought? I cannot believe they got that promotion. They are absolutely insane. They are, they, they, they've lost their mind. How could they give them the promotion? I am so much more better qualified. They're a loser. Don't they understand what they have in me? Instead of wearing those dirty garments, we're to cast them aside into the garbage. And in verse 14, put on the Lord Jesus Christ and make no provision for the flesh to fulfill its lusts. Our fourth and final point this morning, and I wrote it like this. Dress yourself for spiritual success. See, once you realize what the time is, you take off the works of darkness and you set your sights to Jesus Christ to be conformed in His image. And you know what? That should be the goal of every Christian, to be conformed into His marvelous image, to emulate Jesus Christ in everything we do and everything we say to be every Christian's desire to be formed and cuff-formed into the likeness of Christ. You know, when I wake up every morning, I put on my clothes, and aren't you glad that I did this morning, um, but I put on my clothes intending to wear the same clothes all day long. My girls, that's a different subject. They, they put on their morning clothes, and then they put on their princess outfit. Then they take off the princess outfit. They put on their bathing suit. Then off goes that, and then they put on that clothes. And then that clothes comes off because they need the evening outfit. And then after the evening outfit, they need their sleepy clothes. Some of you parents are going, uh-huh. And I think, girls, how can mom came up with the washing with you guys? Six different changes a day. But see, I put on the same clothes and the same thing when I wake up in the morning, Christian. You put on Jesus Christ, intending to wear him all day long. So that no matter where you go, you go wearing Jesus. And guess what? When you're wearing Jesus, he'll keep you out of certain places that you shouldn't go. Really? Yeah. Really. 
really. John puts it like this in 1 John chapter 3, verse 1. Behold, what manner of love has the Father bestowed on us that we should be called the children of God? Therefore, the world does not know us because it did not know Him. Beloved, now we are the children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when He is revealed, we shall be like Him, for we shall see Him as He is. And everyone who has this hope in Him purifies himself just as he is pure. You see, when I wear Jesus, no matter where I go, I'm purified. I'm ready. I'm ready for the return of the Lord. And listen, if you knew that you had the cure for cancer in your mouth, it would be a crime if you didn't open your mouth and speak it, wouldn't it? If you knew you had the cure for AIDS or any other disease, wouldn't it be a shame? Wouldn't it be a travesty? Wouldn't it be a crime if you did not speak it that people could be healed? Well, guess what? God has made his church the instrument of reconciliation, and he's put in your mouth the words of life to tell people. When I was a newbie Christian, I had a dream and I don't know if it was bad tuna or what it was, but it, what, what I, it was vivid. You never had a very vivid dream? And I saw my dad in his car get in a head-on accident and die. Well, I woke up frantic and just, you know, I call my dad up and it's like, you know, he's like waking him out of, you know, sleep and everything. It's like, what's wrong? It's like, I just had a dream, dad, and please be careful. I, I, and then this dream, he got in a head-on accident. Please be careful. Take a different route today. Why? Because I had this dream. Uh, please, Dad, promise me. You'll take a different route. Okay, I'll, I'll take a different route. He drove Malibu Canyon Road every day to go to work. And I don't know if you know Malibu Canyon. It's dangerous. People have died all the time. But that was so real to me. And see, the thing is, is, is if you knew that someone was going to get in a head-on accident, you knew that you could look at somebody and, and it was like, you saw it. Would you, even a stranger, wouldn't you go up to them and say, you're going to be careful. Wouldn't you do that? Well, do you realize that there's an unbelieving world out there that's getting in a head-on accident and they don't even know it? They don't even know it. And God has given you the words of life that you could tell them, hey, Stop. Jesus loves you. He died for you. God has made us the instrument of his reconciliation, the instrument of righteousness. And all you have to do is put on Jesus Christ and open up your mouth and watch God bring people from the kingdom of darkness into the kingdom of light. And do you know what time it is? Do you know what time it is? It's time to shed your foolishness. It's time to use the gifts that God has given you to take off the foolishness and put on Jesus Christ. In a newer translation, we read verse 12, so remove the dark deeds like dirty clothes. And then in verse 14, clothe yourself with the presence of the Lord Jesus Christ and don't let yourself think about ways to indulge your evil desires. Dress yourself for spiritual success, not worldly disappointment. Listen, some of you are going to leave here and say, ah, I'm never going back there. He doesn't know what he's talking about. And, and you're going to go right back into the same worldly stuff, and you're going to be disappointed. And then it's the next church or the next thing. No, stop. Stop the madness. This world is fading away. Don't be nostalgic about the good old days. Don't be nostalgic about your past. Paul says, make no provision for that. Why? Well, have you looked in the mirror lately? We're all fading away. We're all fading away. Don't be nostalgic. Oh, I remember in 85. <laughs> oh, yeah, I was a good shit. No, it's just fading away. The Bible tells us that the glory of man is as the grass of the field that withers away. But to you, Christian, or to you who's on the fence, this is God's promise to you in 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. An inheritance incorruptible and undefiled that does not fade away, reserved for you in heaven. This inheritance, 
that God has for you, it doesn't spoil, it doesn't perish, it doesn't fade. Fade. Hmm. That word fade, it's also translated as hermetia, sin, or fad. Fad. Interesting word. We like to wear fad things, huh? I got new clothes and the new car. I'm styling. Hermateo, sin. Don't get involved in fads. They miss the mark. They lead to destruction and disappointment. So Paul pleads. Paul begs. Make no provision. But instead, put on the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen? Amen. Father, we thank you for your word. And Father, it's, it's one of these times where you're really searching our hearts. You're probing, and, and Lord, you are wanting to make a change. You're wanting to do a work. And Father, I pray that right now we would be yielded to what you want to do in our lives. Father, we recognize that you have recklessly spent your love in a radical way for dying for us on Calvary's cross. Lord Jesus, we thank you that every bit of blood was shed and spilt so that we would all be free from sin and death. And with every eye closed before I say amen or go any further, in light of the fact of what Jesus has done on the cross, that every drop of blood was shed, that you might be set free from sin and death. You now have an opportunity to respond to that. In light of what God has done for us through Jesus Christ, if you've never made Jesus your Savior, if you've never asked Him to come into your heart to forgive you of your sins and to give you a new lease on life, a new life, you need to respond by right now raising your hand and asking the Lord, saying, Lord, I need you. Please forgive me. If there's anyone here this morning, you don't know how much time you have. You don't know what tomorrow is there for. What you have right now is right now. The opportunity to get right with the Lord Jesus Christ. Is there anyone here this morning that would like to do that? Just raise your hand before the Lord and let him see that. God bless you, ma'am. The Lord sees your hand right here. Anyone else? For you, Christian, maybe you've been apart from the Lord. Maybe you've just been dabbling a little bit too much in the foolishness of the flesh in this world. You have an opportunity right now to raise your hand and say, Lord Jesus, Help me to shed those garments. I want to, I want to put you on. I want to wear you. I want, to, I want to, people to see me dressed in your glorious light. If that's you, raise your hand. Let the Lord see you. God bless you, sir. God bless you, sir. Ma'am in the back, the Lord sees you. Sir, right here, the Lord sees you. Sir, back there, the Lord sees you. Ma'am, up front here. Ma'am, in the, over there. The Lord sees you. Anyone else saying, I, I've, I'm done with this world. I'm done. I just want to take this stuff off and I want, to, I want to be clothed in the glorious light of Jesus Christ. Ma'am, in the foyer, the Lord sees you raising your hand. Anyone else before we conclude? Sir, the Lord sees you. God bless you. Father, we thank you for in each and every one of these people that raised their hand. You saw them. You saw their heart. You saw their desire. And Lord, we know that right now you have Remove their dirty garments and you have clothed them in your glorious light. Lord, we ask we as a church would be dressed for spiritual success. That you would fill us overflowing in abundance of your love. That we might make a difference in our families and in our community. Help us, Lord Jesus, to fulfill your will and your call for our lives. We ask now in your precious name. Amen.